In 76, Savior Like a Shepherd, lead us. We'll start with that there. We'll sing all four verses there. Lord, help us to be mindful of that as we go about our uh, lives and we just uh, we would remember the salvation that you gave to us and through Christ and what it cost Christ. That we would be uh, desirous of sharing that with those around us, that we could be a witness and testimony for thee. Bless now our services tonight, that we could lift up and glorify our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we could encourage one another, exhort one another in Christ, and that we could be a witness to those around us in the hotel and the surrounding community. Bless the YouTube broadcast this evening as well, that it would be a blessing to somebody to help point people to Christ that are searching and help encourage believers in their walk with you and to use us in all things for your glory. We give you thanks and honor for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. All right. Well, good to see everybody tonight. And uh, let's see here. Close this off. Um. If we have anything more to mention from this morning, or anything else we need to mention, I can't think of anything. No new developments this afternoon, anything. The world is still out there. People are still cowering behind their masks. And <laughs> so the, the Democrats are still crazy. Still crazy. And, uh, oh, yeah, there was the, the two police. 
people ambushed. The one woman. Um, was, uh, well, the two you know, sheriff's deputies yeah, that were, yeah, they were ambushed. Was that was yesterday, wasn't it? And then uh, the. And, uh, and then the black light or Antifa, Antifa, yeah. Yeah, we're preventing them from getting into the emergency room. Saying, Unbelievable. You know, we want them dead. And mm -hmm. them. What happened? Uh, two sheriff's deputies were ambushed and, and, and shot. They have it on film. Yeah, and, and then as they tried to get into the emergency room with them, Antifa blocked their way. Saying Where they was want this? them dead. Uh, L.A. Yeah, California's L.A. I think those people need to be charged with accessories after the fact. Well, um, English certainly. Over. What's that? The ambush should have ran them over. Oh, yeah, I, I, I saw something. What was it? Uh, Tucker Carlson was uh, uh, interviewing a guy who's a former SEAL, and they were talking about what to do if you're in a mob situation, you're in your car. And he said, don't use your car as a weapon. That's what you do. And make sure your doors are locked, your windows are up, and uh, don't get out. It buys you some time. You know, there's a line of people in front of you, but they're not going to stand up to your car if you just go slowly. Better be judged by well with I read this, I heard this, I don't know how true it is, but it makes sense. That if you, you know, if your windows are all tightly up, mm -hmm. they're, they're under a lot more tension and easier to shatter. But if you just tap the switch mm -hmm. for a second and, you know, uh, you don't want it like cracked, but just yeah. you know, even if you have like a sixteenth of an inch lower, so it, takes the it re releases the tension off and your windows are, yeah. I mean, car windows are actually pretty hard to break unless you have oh, a yeah. hard, sharp, you know, yeah, a yeah, hard point. point. That's why if you've ever seen those emergency tools, they come down to a point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, unless they have, if they have a hammer or a brick or something, that's going to break it. But propane yeah, but torch will work too. It's what's that? A propane torch will work too. Yeah. It's a tempered glass, and usually in size. The only thing is not tempered windshield, but yeah, it's laminated. But uh, these days, when you see report after report, people get out of their car or get pulled out of their car, and they get beaten nearly to death, if not to death, and. Uh, so there's absolutely no reason to get out of the car. So, um, but that's what he was talking about. So anyway, um, so keep praying for our country. And uh, unfortunately, there's no reason to believe that things will get better before the election. In fact, there's every reason to believe that they'll get worse. Even um, after. Yeah. There's a lot of spared in this con this county so far. Yeah, I mean we've been fairly fortunate. Even Cuyahoga County, other than the uh, the uh, celebrations, shall we say, that they had back at the end of May and early June um, has been pretty quiet. I mean, there have been people out there here and there, but it's been generally fairly quiet in terms of destructive aspects of things. But when we were in downtown Cleveland yesterday, we were driving around a little bit, and and what was that on Superior that we were on? Uh, coming along, and, and there were buildings that are still boarded up. No, it wasn't, that wasn't superior. Was that Lake, Lake Lakeside? Lakeshore. Lakeshore, whatever that is. But uh, there were several areas in there that uh, there's still a number of buildings that uh, if instead of plate glass windows, it's plywood down the, down the almost the whole I block. Guess that's that more fitting for the city. Huh? I, mean, I guess that's more fitting for the city. Yeah, at least it wasn't covered with graffiti. The ones, it, what, the ones in Columbus are covered with graffiti, aren't they? Yeah, yeah they're like a the riot. No, this is left over. This is this is in there. So, um, yeah. Well, you wouldn't want to replace it with glass too soon because no, when's the next riot coming? Well, the party season is not over yeah. yet. Wait until it gets nice and cold. Exactly. They don't go out and riot as much in the middle of the winter. Yeah, you know, we, need, thinking, a, we this, need a good, you know, a good ice storm that that keeps people from rioting. It was about twenty below. They were doing yeah. it because they weren't able to so, stand it. Yeah, I hear I hear Denver this past week in the right rioting cut way back when they dropped down to what was it they got down to? They got below freezing. It was one of the earliest freezes in twenty four hours after it had been like yeah, it, it had been a well and the two days before it was in the hundreds. It was like a hundred two or something. Um but uh yeah, it, it went to one of the earliest freezes on record in Denver. So coincidence? I think not. <laughs> Well, it, it does cut back on some of the stuff. It's just like when I was in Colorado, and I remember working for the Forest Service. They were talking about how all these people would sweep up from Boulder and Denver and places <laughs> to live in the mountains to be one with nature. 
during the summer, when it get a little cold, they decided that it was time to not be one with nature and go back down to Boulder and Denver and stuff and stay in the town. But then in the spring, when it warmed up again, they go out to be one with nature and live in the mountains all summer until it got cold again. So, all right. Um, well, anyway, uh, favorite song and testimony. If you got some songs that, that we can pick a song or two, yeah, we'll go from there. Kid, one seventy six. One seventy six. Well, then we should sing a Christmas song too. No, <laughs> or, Brendan, or Christopher. Christopher will be here uh, next weekend, but we won't have the evening service next weekend. Uh, one seventy six. Christ the Rose. All right, number 176, Christ arose. We'll do the first and last verses there. And what would you like to thank the Lord or praise the Lord for this evening? I'm thankful that our Savior didn't stay in the grave, but that he rose again. He paid for our sins. And he's coming back. All right, we'll join in on that first verse, number 176.
on that first verse, number 414, Trust and Obey. Here we go. We walk with the Lord in the light of His Word. What a glory He sheds on our way. When we do His 
So the last song that we did, I happened to see moment by moment over here at 412. So I'm going to do the 412 before we get into the message here. We'll stand moment by moment of the 412. So I'm going to sing all four verses there. 412. We haven't done this one in a while, I think. So. with the music on that first verse. We'll sing all four verses, number 412. I eat with Jesus my death record. Jesus, to glory, don't you? 
about that and thinking, you know, we all have talked about the rapture taking place and all. It'd be good to have some more Bibles out and on hand. So we, we got some and uh, we got another, what, how many did we get? 24 more? No. Or, it was two boxes of 12, wasn't it? Or was it two boxes? Well, there, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's, I think it was two of 12. Yeah, because you had to get 12 to get the lower price. So I think we got two uh, of 12. So yeah, I believe we got 24. So if you like these Bibles, and so we didn't need one. We've got 24 more, so we're we're not in a shortage of them right now. And, uh, and so we we've got some of those that you can have at home as well. So um, just wanted to let you know in case anybody comes and needs a Bible and they really would like to take one with them. God's word going out. You can do it. <laughs> so it's good to have that. All right, we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 12 here. Proverbs chapter 12, and uh, you're getting down to verse number 13 to start here this evening. All right. Now, I'm going to be ambitious and read all the way down to verse 16. So we'll see how it goes. Um, Proverbs chapter 12, starting with verse 13. The Bible says, The wicked is snared with the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. All right, we're going to see if we can get through four verses tonight. And uh, but if not, we'll come back to them another time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to look into your word this evening. 
I would just pray, Lord, that you would open it up to us through your spirit. Give us direction. Give us uh, understanding. Give us insight to the scriptures. And the Bible talks about listening and, and hearkening unto counsel. I would just pray that we would listen and hearken unto the counsel of the spirit of the Holy Spirit speaking to our heart as we look into your word this evening. And again, guide me, direct me as we talk about these things tonight. I just pray that you would help us then uh, to see the things that would be a help to us in our lives, our day-to-day -day lives, Lord, so we can be a better witness and testimony for thee. And Lord, through it all, help us to lift up and glorify Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Proverbs chapter 12 here. And uh, looking at these various uh, individual little proverbs, it's kind of interesting because when you look at these things laid out in different things, some Bibles and some Bible programs and different things like that put paragraph marks from time to time. Have you noticed that? Uh, some, some do, some don't. And uh, one Bible program that I use puts a new paragraph mark for each one of these verses. <laughs> that's, that's what makes it challenging because it's easier to, pre to, you know, to go to a verse you know, where you, you, you have, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a paragraph where all the sentences in the paragraph you know, kind of work together for the theme of the paragraph. And, uh, and, and these right here, where they're all kind of just standalone verses, sometimes, as we said, it's a bit of a challenge to link some of them together. Um, but as I was going through this, I, I was noticing some of the things that we were talking about here, where we start in verse 13, Proverbs 12, verse 13, the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. And we're talking about the things that people say, the things that come out of a person's mouth. And in verse 14, it starts out with, a man shall be justified with good, uh, or satisfied, I'm sorry, with good by the fruit of his mouth. And uh, then, of course, uh, um, as we look at that, these are going to be uh, looked at, the things that the wicked do, the things that the righteous do, and, and kind of compared and contrasted as we go through these. And then that's verses 13 and 14, and then verses 15 and 16, uh, I, I think kind of looks at the underlying motivations of what comes out of the mouth. And uh, so as a sort of a way of bringing them together a little bit, and as you go further down, it's just like, well, where would you stop? Because the next, the, it continues down about what they speak in verse 17, and speaking in verse 18, and the, and the lip of truth in verse 19, and, and on and on. Um, so, but we're going to look at a few things here, and as it says, the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. When, when you look at this, one of the ways to understand this is uh, people have talked about it's good to tell the truth because you only have to remember one story. You, it, it, you know, right? I mean, it, it's... You, if you read and, and you look at the exploits of, of people who um, go undercover as a spy or something like that, you know, somebody goes in, they're working for um, the CIA or whatever, and they go in under an assumed identity, and they have to they have to build what's called a legend, and they and the legend is a false identity, so that when they go through and somebody asks them who they are. Uh, they have to remember to give the name that's on their papers that have been made for them. So they have to remember this false identity. And they got to keep all this straight in their head. I was reading in a, 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 an article one time that was about um, some Russian agents, I believe it was, that were in the United States, and they were living as an American couple. But... Remember, when you grow up, you learn the language that you learn from your parents, which in most of our cases is English, but then you learn a second language later on. So which language do you think in? Usually you, learn, you think in the language that you learn first. There's exceptions, obviously, but this woman was saying the biggest challenge that she had was forcing themselves to think in English because they were Russian and they learned the Russian language first and they normally fought in Russian and said that the part where it was difficult was when you were under stress or something and if you weren't careful you would say something in Russian and blow your cover 
See, so you're constantly trying to maintain this cover. And, uh, and, and we had the same problem running agents in Russia and things like that. That reminds me of that movie, Firefox. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, 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 he's talking about a movie. They had to think in English to steal his plane. Or think in Russian, think in Russian not English. He, he was having problems because he was thinking in English. But the point that I'm getting at here is it says the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips because he says so many things. It's hard sometimes to keep the story straight. And that's what happens, whether it's somebody that's undercover as an agent of another country, you know, an intelligence agent, or whether it's simply a criminal who is a con man or something, he's under a false name, or something as simple. Um, there was about, to, what was this, almost 20 years ago now, I think it was, there was a guy here in Richfield that passed away, and it came out in the news that he wasn't who he said he was. He was in the witness protection program, <laughs> was living in Richfield under a false name. And, uh, you know, and you have to remember these things. And, and so this is what I'm getting at. The, and I'm not saying that, a, that an agent, an intelligence agent, or, or somebody living in a witness protection program is a wicked person. But what I'm saying is when you're not telling the truth and you're trying to get by by not telling the truth, you have to keep track of what stories you told. Otherwise, you'll trip yourself up. If you're just telling the truth all the time, it's easier. I was going to say something. If I can interject, I've heard somebody say, if you're a liar, I mean, a, to be a good liar, you've got to write down your lies. Well, and somehow you've got I mean, to keep track of it. I have a good memory. Yeah, yeah you got to have a good memory. It's easier to just tell the truth. You don't need as good a memory, do you? Because it's one story, and it's always the same. And... So you've got to be able uh, to to uh, you know you should or I'm sorry you should be telling the truth, living uh, a truthful life. And the wicked, because they're living a lie, because they're they're telling falsehoods and they're making things up, they have to juggle all these things to keep them straight. Because once they miss one of them, they all all of them come falling down like a house of cards. And so the wicked will be snared by the transgression of his lips because it's really hard to keep this up. How, how, what do you think they do when they investigate a, a crime that took place and they bring somebody in that, that's a suspect? They ask him a whole bunch of questions. And then they ask him a whole bunch of the same questions a different way. And then later on they come back and they ask the same thing again because they're trying to see if his story changes. And over and over, you get these things where the stories tra change. Um, what was it, just a week ago, just last week, or was it the week before? I think it was just last week with that big accident. It was down here on 76. Oh, well, it was Wednesday. Or Wednesday. Was that just yeah. this past Wednesday? Yeah. With all these stuff going on. I'm trying to keep track of whatever it was. But supposedly, a truck driver got cut off, and they tried to hijack his truck. And uh, and then you know presumably to steal whatever the load was that he was carrying. That was the first story. Well, I read later on, it never happened. He made it up. The way they found out is the police kept asking him what happened, and his story kept changing. And guess what? He lied in the beginning, and because his story couldn't be kept straight, well. He was done in. He was snared by the transgression of his lips. Wouldn't it make more sense just to tell the truth in the first place? You don't have to keep track of everything. So what actually did that? I, they never did find out exactly what happened. But he made some story up about being hijacked, cut off. They couldn't find the truck. They couldn't find the people that were in the truck. And the story started changing. And, and eventually he admitted there was no truck. Nobody cut him off. And uh, but uh, but what happened was he was snared by the transgression of his lips because he didn't tell the truth in the first place. So, as I said, it's better to tell the truth in the first place. Um, the just shall come out of trouble. That doesn't mean telling the truth is going to keep you in trouble or keep you from trouble, but it can help get you out of trouble. And God will take care of us. Why should God? Take care of somebody who's lying. 
well, I'll protect you so that you can keep lying. No, God should let you be at the mercy of whatever's going on if you're living a lie. But when we tell the truth, we can expect God's protection. But let's look at a couple of verses here real quick. Over in Luke chapter 6, the Gospel of Luke chapter 6 here. Luke chapter 6, and let's drop down toward the end of the chapter here, Luke 6, verse 45. Jesus said, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So how are you going to speak the truth, right? Yeah. What, what's a good way to speak the truth? You want to be a good person. Well, how are you going to be a good person? Put your faith in Christ. Your sins are forgiven. The Holy Spirit's in you. Grow as a Christian. Allow God to guide you and direct you in your walk with life. And your heart is filled with the goodness of God. And out of the abundance of the heart... Your mouth should speak. You would speak good things. You would speak truthful things. Otherwise, you're left to the whims of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we give too much credence to the world and the devil when our own flesh is usually the worst problem we have. And when we're filled with those things, well, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And we speak evil things. Um, go over to uh, Psalm 39, Psalm 39, and drop down Psalm 39, drop, uh, well, actually, well, Psalm 39, verse 1. Notice what David said here. I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And, and this idea that he said he's going to sin not with his tongue. He's going to watch what he says. He's going to control his tongue and the things that we're talking about. And that's kind of what we're seeing here in Proverbs chapter 12. Um, the idea that we need to watch what we say, watch how we react to things, watch what comes out of our mouth, because the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. Well, let's continue on, because I want to try to get down through uh, several verses here. In verse 14, Proverbs 12, verse 14, then he says, A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him. And, and as we look at that, um, we think of the idea, again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And uh, so we look at this. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Now, how's that going to happen? Well, it's when we do what David said, and we bridle the tongue. And we keep track, or we keep we rein in what we want to say. And we don't want to just say things without thinking. It's easy to hurt people. It's easy to offend people. It's easy to upset people. It's easy to tarnish our our witness in our testimony if we're not careful in the things that we say. Um, Psalm 63, over here in the Psalm, Psalm 63, and uh, Psalm 63, verse number 5, he says, and David says, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When we think about that, when we're talking about being satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, David said, my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. And also he brings in this idea out of the abundance of the heart. Because David is concentrating on the Lord here. He's thinking about the Lord. And God is blessing him. He says his soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Now, a lot of times we read that today and we don't understand what they're saying there, but anybody know what a marrow bone is? 
sometimes you call them soup bones because you make soup out of them because the bone has the marrow in there it has a lot of nutrients in it and you put that in the pot and you and you just let it simmer and it brings all that nutrient out of the nutrients out of there and the, and of course um, you know in today's culture we want to get rid of the fat but back then the fat was a sign of abundance and and so you wanted and people ate the fat but uh, when we look at this with the marrow um, he's, he's talking about his soul being satisfied as with marrow and fatness there's things from God's Word that, that takes time for it to be brought out. It is, you just don't get it in one reading. You've got to concentrate on it. Like you take those marrow bones and you're looking at it. I mean, we always had some beef cattle, and so we always had a freezer full of meat, and we had marrow bones. And when you looked at those bones, those soup bones, and you, you couldn't just chew on it like a dog and get the nutrient out of it. It takes time. It has to simmer, and it has to spend time. And as you do that, you get the benefit out of it. And so what that tells me is David is saying, just like you would put those bones in and you would simmer them for hours in the water to pull the nutrient out, you've got to spend hours in the Word of God, allowing it to the nutrients to be pulled out, the spiritual goodness to be pulled out of it. And as those spiritual nutrients come out, it nourishes you in the spiritual sense, just like the marrow bone provides that nutrients that you need for your physical being, well-being. And satisfied with marrow and fatness, the richness and, and the blessings of God's Word. And so because he's been meditating on the Word of God and, and the things of God, and God's been blessing him, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is praising the Lord with joyful lips. So when we have that kind of an attitude, that kind of a, a, a spiritual walk, well, a man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. I mean, we're going to be bringing forth good things. Like David brought forth, um, the, he said, the uh, joyful lips. He spoke with joy about the things that God had done for him. In fact, in, in Psalm 63, as he continues in verse 6, he says, When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. That's how he's, the joyful lips, because he's thinking of the things that God's done for him. And he brings that forward. Well, God will do that for us too. And so... A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of man of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. And it's the idea that is that as we're filled with the things of God, it begins to come out in the things that we say. It will also come out in the things that we do. We'll be not only saying godly things, we'll be doing godly things. And... It is going to be a, a benefit to us in our walk with the Lord. The recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unod, and we're a blessing to others. God is going to bless us. Well, there's some other passages that we can look at, too. Um, while we were here in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 12, look down in Proverbs 13, and verse 2, it says, and this is similar to what we just read, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of a contrast there. Um, if we fill ourselves with the abundance of the things of God and uh, we're satisfied with good by the fruit of our mouth, we eat good by the fruit of our mouth. But the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence. That's the opposite of what we see here in Proverbs 12, verse 14, where he says, The recompense of man's hand shall be rendered unto him. Because as we're filled with good things or godly things, we speak of godly things, we do godly things, God's going to bless us in the things that we do. Of course, the opposite then is if we're not filled with godly things, we're filled with ungodly things, we begin to think ungodly things and say ungodly things and do ungodly things. And 
you know, that, that always puts me in mind of the little book of Jude when you use the word ungodly repeatedly. The little book of Jude, second to the last book of the Bible, just one one chapter. And uh, as he's uh, talking about, he, he talks about Enoch and Enoch's ministry in, in the little book of Jude. And then verse 14, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and, and this is where he gets that word ungodly a lot, uh, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly disease, uh, uh, deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He uses the word ungodly a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> but uh, but it, it's, it's what's going to happen. If we fill ourselves with ungodly things, we'll speak ungodly things, and we'll eventually start doing ungodly things. And so we need to fill ourselves with godly things. Enoch preached against the ungodly and warned that God was going to come to execute judgment upon the ungodly for their ungodly uh, deeds and, and all. So the Bible warns us of that. The recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him. Well, we, we're familiar with the passage too. Uh, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, right? So kind of a similar thought there. But coming back to Proverbs chapter 12, and we're moving into verse 15 now, it says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So we've got this idea that we're talking about, the things that we say, and how we've got to fill ourselves with godly things so that we say godly things resulting in doing godly things. The fool is not that way. And the fool is the one that uh, they become snared by the transgression of their lips, and uh, uh, they're leading into an ungodly lifestyle. But the reason that they're a fool is they won't admit that they're wrong. That's why he says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And there are some people who are so ungodly, so wicked, but they justify everything that they do. And you can't convince them that they're wrong. God can't convince them that you're, they're wrong. If God can't convince them, why should we figure we, we do any better? <laughs> if God can't, why are we going to be able to? But they're right in their own eyes. And that's the problem. They are right in their own eyes. They won't listen to anything. They won't listen to anybody. Um, over in Proverbs chapter 1, in Proverbs chapter 1, in verse number 5, of course, it says a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. But see, the fool won't do this. Because the fool says, I already know what's right. I already know that what, I've already justified what I'm doing. Why do I need to listen to you? Why do I need to listen to anybody else? They're right in their own eyes. So they're the exact opposite of the wise man that will hear an increase in learning. The fool won't hear, won't listen, because why should he? He's right in his own eyes. Look in Proverbs chapter 16. <clears throat> Excuse me, Proverbs chapter 16. And let's see. Um, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. See, so the fool is right in his own eyes. He looks at what he's doing, and he's fine. He can pat his hands together and say, I, I'm, I'm okay. I've done everything fine. Justifies everything he does. But then there's the warning there. The ways of the man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. He gets to the heart. What was the motivation? Why were you doing that? And it doesn't matter whether you convinced yourself of that or not. God sees the deception, whether it's deception that somebody else brought on you or whether it's self-deception. God sees the heart. He judges the spirit. He knows what's happening. 
what she wasn't set up now. <laughs> but uh, um, here's another passage in Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the wrong one here, read, read my thing wrong here. Um, yeah, I was correct, Proverbs chapter 30 here, and uh, verse number 12, that's the one I'm looking for. Actually, verses 11 and 12, there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. Like the fool, they justify everything that they've done. They're not doing anything wrong. We're pure, pure in their own eyes. And is, yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their teeth, their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. And, and when you look at this, this is what we're seeing today, isn't it? There are people who claim to be Christians, but they're a generation that curses mother and father. They're a generation that are pure in their own eyes. But the problem is, just like Jesus warned the church at, the, at, at uh, um, Laodicea, he said they, were, they thought that they had everything they needed, but they were blind and poor. And that's what we have today. We have a generation of so-called Christians today that are blind and poor like those in Laodicea. We have a generation of Christians today that they're pure in their own eyes, but yet they're not washed from their filthiness. They're still in their sin. And they can't understand the things of God, and yet they're right in their own eyes. Well, there's churches today where you go in, if you share the gospel message, they'll tell you that you don't know what you're talking about. God's loving and merciful, and everybody goes to heaven. If you try to tell them that Islam is a satanic religion, oh, you're a hateful person. Nobody should be hateful. We really hate people like you. That's what they do. <laughs> but but, but, the, the, but that's because the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And we saw that back in Proverbs 1, where the wise man listens to count wise counsel. And we benefit from it. So we don't want to be like the fool. Because... <laughs> The Bible says in here in Proverbs uh, 12 and verse 16, and this is where we come down, where I want to tie in the verse 16 with this as well, a fool's wrath is presently known. And if you look at that, that's kind of like where we started in verse 13, where the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. The fool's wrath is presently known. Their sin is going to find them out. They can't cover for it forever. And you'll find that some of these people who are so loving and so perfect in their own eyes, when you point out the Bible says, and they don't like what you're pointing out, they suddenly become rather unloving oftentimes, don't they? <laughs> and, and you feel their wrath. The, the fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man cover it with shame. And in reality, what we have going on in this verse is a fool's wrath is presently known. They're right, you're wrong, doesn't matter what the facts are. And when you cross them, they're quick to let you know. The wrath comes out quickly. Because they're not filled with godliness, they're filled with ungodliness. And so they're ready to go on the attack. They're ready to, to tell you how terrible you are, they're ready to, their wrath comes out on you when you cross them, when you show them that they're wrong. They get upset, and you feel their wrath. There's nothing holding them back. They're an ungodly person. And so their heart's filled with ungodliness. Ungodly things come out of their mouth. 
ungodly, they do ungodly things, and that's in contrast, but a prudent man covereth shame. And what he's talking about here is not that we cover up sin and say, pretend it's not happening. Don't, don't look over here. There's nothing back there. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about, the fool, because of his ungodly nature, is easily offended, and his wrath comes out very easily. But the prudent man, the person that's the godly person, you fill yourself with godly things, you're going to take abuses, and you're going to take insults, and you're going to take things where people try to slight you, and you're not going to get upset at the least little thing. We're going to realize, hey, they hated my Savior. It's no wonder they don't like the things that I'm doing and saying. saying. And so we will cover, in a sense, that shame by not getting upset with it. We're going to overlook certain things that people say. I mean, it's easy to look at things that people do and get angry at them. It's easy to look at what the governor of California is doing to churches out there and telling Christians they can't meet in churches, they can't even have a Bible study in their own home, and they can't sing and praise God in their own home in a home Bible study, let alone in a church service. But you can go to a casino, and you can go to a, any number of other things, but you can't have church service. And we get mad at the governor in California. We get mad at the judge that told the um, MacArthur's church that they are not allowed to meet today. And Or we can say, you know what? That person or those people, those individuals, they're a victim of demonic lies. They're in the sway of the devil. They're a person that needs the Lord. And not that we're covering up their sin, I mean, we know what their sin is, but we cover the shame in the sense that we can keep from getting real worked up over it and angry in the sense that the fool would. We can express our objection. We can overlook, uh, I don't want to say overlook, but we can rise above the fray so that we can be the godly influence in these situations. You know, uh, what what keeps a fight going among kids? You know, one person looks at somebody funny and the other person, the other child calls them a name. Why? Because he looked at me funny. And so you look at the one funny and then, and so then that one shoves the person that looked at him funny. The person that shoved the one that looked at got shoved has to hit the one that, that, that shoved him. And the one that got hit has to kick the one that and then they're in a fight. You say, how did the fight start? Well, he kicked me. Why did he kick me? Kick you because he he punched me. Well, why did he punch you? Well, because he shoved me. Why did you why did you shove him? Because he called me a name. You see how it, it just escalates. Boom, boom, boom. Somebody along the way has to de-escalate. And I think that's the role of Christians, a prudent man covering shame, try to de-escalate some of these things, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 4. See if this helps any. First Peter chapter four. In first Peter chapter four, and let's drop to verse number seven. First Peter chapter four, starting verse number seven. He says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. He's talking about for Christians here, believers. And be ye sober, or therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Charity, remember, is a type of love that wants to give to the needs of others. And when we see other people, and when we love them, and we have that type of love, and we know that we can share with them God's truths and things like that, and we want them to get saved and then grow as Christians, and we have a love for them that they would do that, 
covering the multitude of sins means that we're willing to take a multitude of wrongs and overlook some things. We're not going to let them get us upset. It's like what Jesus did on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he wasn't giving a blanket forgiveness to everybody so that everybody that was at the cross was absolved of sin and become a, belie- a born-again believer all of a sudden. But he was rising above the situation. And we need to do that as well. Um, charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Somebody says something, and instead of right away thinking, why did they say that to me? Are they trying to make me upset? Are they trying to say bad things about me? We say, you know, maybe I misunderstood what they said. We rise above it. Well, maybe they're having a bad day. We rise above it. Why didn't that person shake my hand? Well, maybe they worried about the virus. Maybe they didn't see me. Why did that? You see what I'm saying? We give them the benefit of the doubt. We rise above it in the situation. And don't get angry and allow the flesh to dictate uh, what we do and say. Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Look at one more passage here in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And... uh, I'm sorry, this is where you get, I get mildly dyslexic. I was going to chapter 2, verse 4, but I'm supposed to be in chapter 4, verse 2. Let's flip that around. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 2, where Paul says, with all lowliness. In fact, why don't we go to verse 1, because that gives you the context a little bit better. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Ephesians uh, 4, starting verse 1, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond, the bond of peace. But look at that. With all lowliness and meekness, not being haughty and having to be better than everybody else, not lifted up with pride and thin-skinned and all that. He says, with long-suffering. You know, so what if if I didn't get a handshake? That's okay. (laughs) I get a handshake the next time. You know, I'll shake his hand twice. I'll shake it twice as hard. Whatever. (laughs) But but no, long-suffering. Forbearing one another in love. Forbearing one another in love means being considerate of each other. The love that we have for each other, other, we're going to overlook the problems. You know, when when couples have problems, whether it's a married couple or uh, uh, just a dating couple, when they have problems, they tend to look at the faults in the other person. But when they're in love, all the faults go by the wayside. You know, it's like those classic things. What does... What does she see in him? Or what does he see in her? Well, they don't see the faults because they're in love. You know, They don't see the faults. Love glosses over all those faults. But when somebody starts looking at the faults instead of the good things of that person, <clears throat> then it becomes harder to love that person. But when you love somebody, you tend to overlook the faults and look at the good qualities, the good things, and concentrate on them. And, and, and in reality, in a lot of counseling, when you get people to look at the good parts of the other person, you overcome a lot of the problems that they're having. Because the more people look at the negative aspects of each other, the more problems they have. But the more they look at the good aspects of each other, the better their relationship is. Because love does cover a multitude of faults. And so that's the same idea here. The prudent man covereth shame. We want to get along with people. We want to love people. We want to look for the good qualities. You know, when we were in the Samoan Islands, remember there was people who came down to Samoa from from the States and from Canada. 
and uh, in other words, from a more developed uh, life living or country lifestyle to a less developed country lifestyle. And some people arrive there and all they did was look at things and go, well, at home, we had this. And here, they don't have it. At home, we did this. And here, they don't do it. And everything was negative. All the faults that they could find, and remember there was a couple, it was actually an Assemblies of God couple that arrived at the same time, about the same time we did. And we met this one guy, and he always asked how Kim was doing. It wasn't until we'd been there for about two, three years before he ever stopped asking why Kim was doing, or why Kim was doing, how Kim was doing. And the reason we found out was because over the years that he had lived there, he'd lived there since I think the 1960s, and this is in the 1990s. And he said that he had seen various missionaries and, and uh, ministers from off-island come. And he said, invariably, if the wife was never happy and never satisfied and always was finding what was wrong and never could find anything to like, they never lasted, right? And, and that was his concern. How's she doing? But when Kim and I got to Samoa, we, we, for some reason, we just had it in our head that we would look around and say, oh, this is like back home. Oh, I remember this from when I was growing up. We used to do things this way. We looked for all the positive things. It worked well enough. We stayed there for, what, four years. So I guess it must have worked okay. Um, but that's what the permit man does. We look for the positive things. We don't concentrate on the negatives in people and, and things. We try to look for the positive so that we can rise above the, the way the rest of the world lives, tossed back and forth the world, the flesh, and the devil. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. And so as you look at this, it affects what's going on in the heart. Or I should say what, what's going on inside affects what comes out of the mouth. It affects what we do with our hands, and it affects our attitude towards things. And going back to the godly and ungodly phrases again, if you're filled with ungodly things, you're going to be thinking ungodly thoughts, saying ungodly things, doing ungodly things, and you're going to have an ungodly attitude. <laughs> but if you fill your things with the things of God and develop that godly heart, filled with godly thoughts, godly things coming out of our mouth, doing godly things will develop a godly attitude towards those around us. And that's where we come down to that, uh, that verse there in uh, Proverbs uh, 12 that we, looked, that we ended on. The fool's wrath is presently known because he's filled with ungodliness. That's what comes out, and he can't escape it. That's the natural end result. But the prudent man covereth shame. He can rise above all these little things, these little things that most people get so upset about because the godly nature begins to come out. We can rise above it that we can love people and work with people and help people and point them to Christ and be a witness to them without being overcome with all the little slights and things that they, that they do. Well, that brings us through. We made it through uh, four verses tonight. That's pretty good on Proverbs lately here. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to get through one verse. But uh, um, I think it all ties together. And so, uh, Lord willing, we will continue this again. Remember, next week we will not have the evening service. Um, so it will be in about two weeks, barring the rapture, of course. In two weeks, uh, we, will, we will continue on it. If the rapture takes place, anybody that's left can still feel free to come and do whatever you want. But... Uh, um, anyway, let's go ahead and close in prayer there. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to look into your word this evening and challenge us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be filled with godly thoughts and godly uh, thinking uh, that comes from knowing Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the only way we can truly have that godly nature, to know that Christ is our Savior, to know that our sins are forgiven, to know that Christ paid the penalty for all of our sin, that with his blood that he shed as he suffered and died on the cross, that our sins were washed away. And as Jesus died on that cross and was buried, and he spent three days and three nights in that tomb, and then rose again victorious over sin and death, 
there's the there's the certainty, uh, the guarantee that that price was that, or that the payment was sufficient, that our sins are forgiven, and that, that we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. So, Father, again, we just pray that uh, first and foremost that uh, we would know that we're saved, and then after we know that we're saved and our sins are forgiven, and we know that the Spirit of God has taken up residence in us. We can grow on a daily basis closer to you by filling our hearts and our minds with godly things, filling it with the word of God, thinking about the things that you've done for us, and talking about these things as David did, meditating on these things, that we can have those godly thoughts in us that will come out in the things that we say, the things that we do, and the attitude that we have in dealing with people around us, that you can use us as a testimony to your grace that we can draw uh, closer to you and be conformed to the image of Christ, that you can use us to reach people with the gospel, that people will be saved. And, and again, we just pray that we could bring glory to your name through the things that we do. Father, again, work in our hearts, guide us and direct us. Bless now as we sing an invitation song for us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and stand and uh, let's turn to number 565. I'm praying for you, number 565. 565, I'm praying for you. We'll sing all four verses there. If you need to get alone with God in prayer, let me encourage you to do so. As we sing this song tonight. Music on the first. Here we go. Savior may bring them to glory 
somebody along the way and pray that you could point people that are searching to Christ and encourage believers in their walk with you again on the radio and then again the week ahead Lord just pray that you bless our time the opportunity we have uh, to, to minister to others bless the things that are online use them to uh, to reach others with the gospel message and encourage them in their walk with you and again help us to lift up and glorify Christ in all that we do give us opportunities this week to be a blessing to somebody to be a witness to somebody, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The wretched excesses of her and the no, other no, Democrats no. are turning no. more voters to Trump. There's a there's okay. lesson there. Yeah, you there you go. <laughs> There's good things when you look for it. <laughs> Do you hear it was the uh, I, I 